this sermon preached by Dr. Lawrence Bash on Sunday, April the 30th, 1967, was entitled, Jacob Who Wrestled. If you are one of those who, who feels uh, skeptical about uh, degree of validity of the Bible as the Word of God, as many people do today, it must be acknowledged, I call your attention to the immense fascination that these characters from the very earliest history, perhaps prehistory, still exert upon us. We cannot let them go, or they won't let us go even though they emerge from the very mists of time before history as such was being written. Jacob is one of the men of whom I think. If you think the Bible is a book to which you turn and uh, in some flat fashion pick a verse and tell your son live like that, don't pick the life of Jacob can hardly suggest that the younger generation emulate him. Someone has said he's both the best and the worst man in the Bible. Neither statement being true, he is not the best and he is not the worst. But he is certainly a paradox, a contradiction covered with skin. Jacob will rest. Now, he's an important figure, if for no other reason, the impress which he has left upon his people. They are called the children of Israel. And Israel is Jacob. In the 32nd chapter of Genesis, the scripture lesson this morning recounted the event when the man who kneeled as Jacob rose as Israel. From that time on, his descendants to many, many, many generations, even as of this time, were likely to call themselves the children of Israel. Not of Abraham, though this is not impossible and does happen. Not the children of Isaac, though both would be just as accurate. The children of Israel. He left his impress, impress upon the country in which he lived. Bethel, where the ladder rose to heaven. Peniel, Peniel, or Penuel. <laughs> You're safe with any one of the three. No one can contradict you. See, in these ancient languages, there were no vowels when it was put into writing. Everyone knew whether it was A, E, I, O, or U that went in a given word. So all of the ancient documents are consonants only. And by the time it moves from Assyrian to Egyptian to Aramaic uh, to Greek to Latin to English, there's no telling. Peniel, Peniel, Penuel. What is the place? And I'm interested in the place because about three months from today, I'm planning on putting my feet on it. Damascus in Syria, to which Paul went, will be the starting point one morning for a group of us who will drive down across the Syrian landscape into the Holy Land. We shall cross the border there into the Hashemite kingdom of the Jordan in what is technically Transjordan, across the Jordan River on the other side, in the land of Gilead. And we'll be looking around for bomb on all sides. Probably won't find them. But we will be thinking of the historic memories that are associated with that country, which there are very many indeed. This not the least of them. For here it was that once there came a man to a river which still flows with its ancient name, Jabbok, running into the Jordan and then on into the Dead Sea. And here occurred one of those encounters which is not dated. It is simply not dated. It says just as much to the late 20th century I judge, as it did in its own time. Indeed, I look at this confused world in which I live, where we are in continual torment over 
religion on the one hand and the hold that it has or used to have upon our lives and all of the change that takes place. Read the religion page of Time magazine this past week. The three stories are occupied exclusively with this tension between the ancient and revered and the new. The Orthodox Jews in Jerusalem are demonstrating and nearing the point of riot, even to threaten the government, because an ancient biblical text in their judgment is being countermanded by a modern rule. In 1953, the government authorized post-mortems, the autopsy, so familiar here. But among the Orthodox, certainly the extreme Orthodox Jew, forbidden. There is a verse in the Old Testament that speaks of burying the dead before nightfall, which certainly had its reasons when it was proclaimed. This ancient rule still holds the loyalty of a number of people, and in modern-day Israel, the medical profession wants the post-mortem in order to save the future. So here's the world in tension between the, the, the loved, the ancient, the old, and the revered, and the claim of the present day. Now the story deals with the problem of the Roman Catholic Church, and again, birth control. It's... Uh, it's the walkout in Catholic University in Washington over Father Curran. Father Curran, who was fired from the faculty because, well, who knows? At least it is known that uh, he has publicly asked a change in his church's law on birth control. This is, again, the ancient and the respected, that which is identified with religion and with loyalty to God in conflict with the claim of the modern era and what is believed to be scientific knowledge or the secular world. We are constantly, all of us, caught in this and we are thrust back to a discovery of what is really valid in our religious faith. Now, both these instances, instances, I'm on the side of the rebels, as you would probably guess. And yet I know that when I go back to the 32nd chapter of Genesis and begin to deal with some material that in all truth and all honesty I cannot call flatly history, nevertheless the story reaches out to claim us and say something to us that our glossy civilization doesn't say. We've not outgrown it. It is just as relevant today as it has ever been. I say this in the knowledge that I think I'm dealing here with something other than objective history. History is written by a newspaper reporter who sat on the sidelines and reported what he saw. It is a story about a man, a man wrestling with God. If I ask myself whether... In all truth, I believe the eternal God came down and wrestled with a man and that the man saw him face to face as he claims, as you will see. I remember that the Bible also says no man has seen God and I think I must go with this uh, later text. But if I ask myself whether the experience that is here recounted is a valid experience then it is way ahead of my generation, isn't it? That's the question that we're dealing with this morning. Jacob, the wrestler. Well, let's take a look at it, will you? The story, the 32nd chapter of Genesis. I'm reading from the Jerusalem Bible, this new translation which comes from, from Jerusalem, exactly where it was translated. And it reads as follows. That same night he, namely Jacob, rose and taking his two wives and his two slave girls and his eleven children, he crossed the ford of the Jabbok. Not the Jabbok that I'm looking forward to seeing among other things. It's just a stream that flows down out of 
rather high mountains of Transjordan into the Jordan River. And between the height of the mountain and the river, it isn't a very broad space, a few miles. So we know pretty closely where this event must have taken place. And I shall there try to remember what happened there. Obviously, you need more information than we have up to the present time for this man with his two wives and two slave girls, etc., has uh, more than meets the eye in this verse alone. He is bringing not only his family and immense herds, the measure of great wealth, but he is bringing some memories to that river. Across that river, he expects to meet an old friend, indeed, an old brother, namely Esau. Now, you remember Esau and Jacob, the twin brothers of Isaac and Rebekah. But Esau had, by chance, been born first. Therefore, he got all the prerogatives that went to the firstborn, and these were considerable in that day. He became head of the family on the death of Isaac. He got twice the share of the property otherwise available to him. He got the blessing, this uh, mystical blessing of the father to the sons. We, we can't understand it at all, I'm sure. We have nothing in the equivalent of it whatsoever. It was a significant thing. Esau was the one who gambled away, or who traded away, all his prerogatives for a mess of pottage, in the old translation, a bowl of soup, a bowl of cherries. And Jacob was the one who traded him out of the birthright, and the blessing, and the property. So we know immediately that we are dealing here with a schemer, a man who would defraud his own brother, who, in the story I've just recounted, lied flatly to his own father, who, after he gets the birthright, if he's to enjoy it, better get away from home, so has fled from Hebron and gone clear across the Holy Land and up to Haran, where his uncle Laban lives and been there for 20 years, who has schemed against him who throughout his life has, according to the record, cheated anyone who gave him an opportunity, and if all his closest relatives, who else? The others weren't important enough, I guess, to get into the story. So, he has memories. Now, I can't admire Jacob very much. First, he got away with it, <laughs> over and again. I don't mind my villains so much if they get whopped down in the last reel. But he got away with it. He got the birthright and the blessing. And he got uh, Rachel. He also had to take Leah in the bargain, but that's another subject that I'll reserve for some other occasion. If you're probably about two wives, he was two, I think. Slave girls and all this, that's another subject. What was the distinction here between these two men that gives them such different roles, which makes their significance such different quality. Well, this is a very old story, and you know it about as well as any in the Old Testament, I judge. We generally put it in this fashion. Esau was a man of this world. He was like him. He was an extrovert, I think we call him. A hunter, or he was out hunting when all this happened. A uh, man of the field. Hearty, open, honest, forthright. I don't believe I can recall that Esau ever did anything underhanded. He had only one problem. He lived in this world alone. He had no horizon beyond the horizon that the physical eye could see. There was no dimension to his life beyond the dimension of the material. He believed that one should eat, drink, and be merry, or tomorrow you die. He was a materialist. Life is just a bowl of cherries. And so Esau sat down at the bowl of cherries and ate them. And they buried the pips with him, and he died. 
And Jacob, crook that he was, and there's no need trying to shine him up any, crook that he was. There was still something about Jacob that will not let us go. There was an awareness of the meaning of human existence that not only has a religious dimension, it has a human dimension. For if men have not that, uh, which was the unique and significant thing in the life of Jacob, he is, in my judgment, less than man. What it begins to emerge, or what we discover in Jacob, is something that makes man man as against an animal, as against a beast. It is he who discovers value. It is he who pushes out the horizons of life. It is he who recognizes the existence of some dimension other than the purely physical, the purely material. It is he who knows what the intangible, the spiritual, the moral means. It is he who knows what blessing means even if you and I find it difficult to even define it. It is he who knows what the tradition of a family can mean, who looks on to the generations yet to come. It is he who knows that he cannot rest until he has come to peace with God. And this marks the division between Esau and Jacob. Esau, the man of this world, who knew how to live well, to enjoy the good things of life. And Jacob, who wrestled in the dark until he saw the face of God. A poetic way of saying, until he got through, which is, of course, a metaphorical way of saying what each of us understands, I trust. I turn to this 32nd chapter. I read this passage. As I said, he brought quite a lot of freight along. Not just the wives and the concubines and the 11 children, who with the 12th Benjamin will become the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. He brought memory. And he got to the Jabbok, and there he waited. He took them across the stream and sent all his possessions over too. And Jacob was left alone. And there was one that wrestled with him until daybreak, who, seeing that he could not master him, struck him in the socket of his hip. And Jacob's hip was dislocated as he wrestled with him. He said, let me go, for day is breaking. But Jacob answered, I will not let you go unless you bless me. He then asked, what is your name? Jacob, he replied. He said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Because you have been strong against God, you shall prevail against men. Jacob then made this request. I beg you, tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? And he blessed him there. Jacob named the place Peniel, because I have seen God face to face, means to the face, and I have survived. The sun rose as he left Peniel, limping because of his hip. That is the reason why to this day the Israelites do not eat the sciatic nerve, which is in the socket of the hip because he had struck Jacob in the socket of the hip on the sciatic nerve. Now, friend, if you press me, I shall have to say that I do not think this is a journalistic account, and that if one waits until some figure like a man comes to wrestle him in the darkness of the night, he will wait a long time. But I will say you are very insensitive if you do not know what wrestling in the night means and not alone in the night, wrestling in the day. You are very insensitive if you do not know what it means to live on the one hand as a man of this earth, before him a bowl of cherries, a mess of pottage, finding his ultimate satisfactions in that, and on the other hand, to live within the dimensions of the eternal, to be aware of value, 
to live in a moral universe, to feel the claim of the eternal God upon him, and not to be satisfied until one has wrestled his way through. I would present the proposition that it would not be unfair, not far from the mark, to say that our generation is the generation of Esau, that this characterizes us about as fairly as uh, any term one could put upon the 20th century in the United States, the century of the happy, well-adjusted extrovert who knows what he wants and goes out to get it. And what did he want? He wanted a bigger house and a modernized kitchen and all the new plumbing accessories and television and then color television and a beautiful lawn and a swimming pool and another car and all of the other rewards of the material universe. Supposing that this was life. And he got it pretty well. And now he looks at his society and wonders where the cracks are coming from. What's wrong when the things that we live for turn out to be a bunch of two-day-old cherry pits? What happens when you set your heart on the things of this earth and get them, then they're not enough. I would take the hazardous risk of saying that it may be that this element of youth today, to which has been applied the term a hippie, who made our newspaper this morning, I see, may well be revealing at this point. It's a little risky for this uh, illustration because I don't personally know any hippies, unless some of you are, and no one has told me he was. I have to read about them, and this is uh, untrustworthy, I, I believe. One should know what he's talking about better than I do. But I've read the analysis of them by the director of psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin, from which I have quoted before, and I think it may be uh, sufficient uh, to go on up to this point. He says, now keep in mind, these are not beatniks. These are not the product of the disadvantaged element in our society. These are not ghetto people. These are not ignorant people. These are the children of the typical middle-class home which has been scrabbling after a nicer kitchen, a nicer bathroom, wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, color television, and got and then their kids grow up and take a look at it and they have no taste for it. So that in effect they have turned their back upon the establishment. They have said the values for which our parents have well nigh laid down their lives have fought like tigers in the halls of commerce and trade. They're no good. We don't want to live in order to see commercials in living color. Come to think about it, I'm not sure I want to live for that either. I shouldn't have brought that in. Well, it fits pretty well, nevertheless. These are the passive young people who are turning to various flights from reality because life has become tasteless for them. The LSD crowd. And I judge that it would not be difficult to find more illustrations of the point that I'm seeking to establish this morning. I look at uh, the direction in which the moving pictures are going, in which the main emphasis seems to be to find something a little more shocking than last month, and I ask, when they've gone through all of the shock, and I assume they will, what then? If you have to live for a new novelty, if your satisfaction is only in shocking the old and the staid, you're going to run up against the day when there's not even 
a shock laugh. Then what? We are getting to the point, friend, where we can, can take our society, which has been dead set for more years than we like to remember, on bringing out of the material world all its gifts, all its bowls of cherry, cherries, and now we know, great numbers know, it is not enough. The frantic and frenetic pace of life, the suicide rate, the general disorganization of modernity certainly must have some relationship to this. Man does not live by bread alone, nor by any of the other things, no matter how tantalizing and intriguing. Esau thought he did. Jacob, crooked as a dog's hind leg, had this one redeeming feature. Though he stumbled and fell on his path of life, it at least led toward the dawn. He was at least mo moving toward a recognition and awareness of God. Now, if a man will struggle with God, will wrestle with God, or shall we put it a little more humbly in such terms, if a man is willing to wrestle with the moral issues and the spiritual issues of his life, then his path is toward the dawn. But do we? Now, I suppose I preach this sermon because I wonder whether we do or not. I wonder whether my generation is not so wedded to institutional religion, to formalized religion, to real dependence upon such things as coming to worship and paying a church pledge, belonging to a circle, and so on, that it doesn't really wrestle at all. Or do we? Well, of course, this ceases to be a generalization now, valid though in my judgment it is, and becomes a personal issue which each one of us must struggle with. Or do you? Do you ever struggle with the issues that come out of this book when we open it week after week? Or are you simply spectators and auditors of the performance put on in the pulpit Sunday after Sunday? Do we ever get under your skin? Do we ever wrestle through a dark night? What is the moral quality of one's life? Where is the cutting edge of my own soul? Where are the temptations against which I struggle? Or do I really struggle at all? Isn't it enough to say the Lord's Prayer on Sunday morning? Let that wipe out to whatever has gone the week before. How do I seek for truth, light, love, right, the will of God? Call it what you will. Now, I think we have here a story that might even be called myth. I don't think myth is untrue by any means. I think it is very true. It is even truer than the front page of your newspaper. And I offer it to you, friend, in order to encourage you to, to do that wrestling within, without which man wins no moral victories, without which God cannot get through to him, which is indeed openness to the claim of the eternal upon oneself. Esau enjoyed the good life, and they buried him with his cherry pits. Jacob fell often on his road, but his face was set toward the light, and he brought the kind of intense devotion to the spiritual quest which made the Hebrew people the spiritual geniuses of the world as they have been, and which ultimately produced the cradle for a Savior, even Jesus Christ, root Jacob.